All right, I think we got 33 people in here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this is being recorded, uh, just for FYI. Um, yeah, so thanks for being here, everybody. Welcome to the first office hours of the fifth cohort of the Protocol Fellowship. Uh, today's office hours is going to be a bit different maybe than some of the other ones. Um, we have Tim Bako here, who is the uh, coordinator of the all core devs um, calls on, uh, I guess, just the execution layer, all core devs um, every other Thursday. And he is going to give us uh, a bit of a presentation around um, Ethereum governance and how all of the decisions get made, how hard forks are decided and and all of that sort of good stuff. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Mario. Mario can maybe give Tim a, a, a nicer introduction than me. Um, and then we'll pass it off to Tim to to give us his presentation. And then we'll have some time for a Q&A at the end. So Mario. Yep. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining today. Um, Hello, Tim, and, and all the fellows. Uh, welcome to the first office hours. I need to repeat that. It's uh, the, the whole community is starting, and we are uh, kicking it off with a special guest. So, um, as Josh said, Tim, uh, Tim coordinating the, the ACD, uh, helping to coordinate the hard forms, the core development, is uh, uh, the best person to uh, learn about the, the core protocol ecosystem from. Uh, uh, during the uh, after the presentation, there will be space for questions. So I, uh, uh, so we can do a quick camera if my, I'm sorry, if my bandwidth is not this, but then with the camera. Uh, so. Is it better now? Yeah, that's way better. That's better. Yeah, I'm sorry, my mic was sitting so powerful. Uh, yeah, Tim is the best person to talk about the uh, overview of the of the core uh, ecosystem, or the core protocol ecosystem of all these teams. I understand when you are now uh, just diving into Ethereum, when you're looking through these different clients, the different layers, it might be a bit, bit confusing. And um, I believe that Tim has the best overview of what is happening in the core protocol on, on all of these layers. And uh, he's the one who keeps the uh pushing the discussion further so uh, i believe very inspiring person and please uh during his presentation if you have any questions uh write them down remember them and you can ask him anything uh, after the after the presentation is over so uh i hope we will have some interesting questions and keep the discussion going afterwards yeah so again tim thank you so much for joining um yeah are, are you with us yes i am oh, can, awesome. can you hear me yeah, all good. Yeah, you're all clear. Yeah, sorry about my mic again. Um, yeah, I guess the stage is yours. Thank you so much again for being here. And yeah, we are looking forward to learn something from you. Many people eager to dive into Ethereum. Yeah. Uh, uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that Tim is actually our colleague from Protocol Support of Ethereum mm -hmm. Foundation. And as a protocol supporter, he's also a big supporter of this program. He's actually the, the other manager of this program, uh, 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 a part of me and Josh. He's uh, uh, He's been he's been um, supporting the EPF, so yeah, glad to have you here, Tim. Again, yeah, um, well, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, okay, let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, okay, can people see? Can people still see my screen? Yes, yep. all good. Okay, awesome. Uh, I cannot see the 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 video anymore, so um, I'll just run through this. Um, but yeah, um, so my name is Tim Bako. Um, like Nero said, I'm part of the protocol support team at the EF. Uh, what I do uh, as a day job is run the awkward devs calls. And so um, I want to spend some time today talking about like how Ethereum governance works, um, both in theory and practice. So like how it's like defined and then how it actually happens. Um, because given you're all part of EPF, I think like the most important thing to walk through is just like what does the engineering process uh, kind of look like when we want to work on an Ethereum network upgrade. Um, and then I'll end with like a few notes on like what actually are core devs, um, some other like resources. I'll share the, the slides in the chat uh, after. And then uh, I'm hoping to leave a fair amount of time for Q&A uh, at the end. Um, 
And yeah, because I can't see anyone, I guess I'll just run through the slides and do questions all at the end. If there's something really unclear, feel free to just jump in and stop me as I'm as I'm speaking. Um, okay. Um, so I guess to, to kick this off, like how to think about just Ethereum governance uh, at like the you know most most simple level, um, how it's organized. So you can think of it as as three different stages where. Um, we have EIPs or Ethereum improvement proposals, which are basically the, the specification format that we use to propose changes to the Ethereum protocol. Um, so the first EIP, EIP1, basically explains how all of this works. So it tells you, you know, like if you want to write an EIP, here's how you have to do it um, and sort of outlines kind of how people approach the specification process. And then when they do, they sort of, um, you know, end up with an EIP that tracks a set of changes to the protocol. So the one I have on the screen now is EIP 1559, which was a, a pretty uh, big change from a few years ago to Ethereum. Um, and so if you go to like eeps.ethereum.org slash eep slash EIP 1559, you can see the entire sort of set of changes that this EIP proposed. Um, and then the way Ethereum is specified um, is that there is like a common specification uh, for all of the protocol rules. So we have two main places where this is tracked, um, Ethereum slash consensus specs, Ethereum slash execution specs. Uh, we also have the yellow paper, uh, but that tends to be out of date. But so in these three places, you sort of have the set of all of the current protocol rules um, on the execution layer, on the consensus layer, and then uh, the yellow paper is also just for the execution layer. And so when an EIP is accepted, what it's effectively saying is it's like a diff that you apply on top of uh, these specs. And some of the EIPs are literally written that way, where like um, the EIP itself only contains like the sort of rationale and motivation for the change, but then the actual technical changes are, are literally a diff on top of, of one of these specs. Um, Tim, I'm going to stop you for a second. Um, can, are you yeah. changing slides? Oh, have yes. you changed? Okay, we're not seeing the slides change. Okay, uh, that, that happened. Yeah, maybe going into presentation mode might be helpful. Okay, uh, how do I do that? Oh, I was in presentation mode, by the way. Yeah, you were sharing the other screen, the the slide screen, not the presentation screen. Uh, okay, so okay, let me try yeah. something real quick. It's Sorry other, about that. Other window. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just annoying because I can't, I can't pre-share the present. Like as soon as I click on the presentation, you, I lose. You need to open the presentation and then choose the uh, choose the window of yeah, the presentation. But then I can't, I can't open. Um, once it's open, I yeah. can't come back here. Basically. <laughs> um, okay, let you me just share it. my entire screen. Um, see if this works. Um, and we'll, we'll try it that way. Um, okay. Yep. Can you see slides moving now? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. All good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Cool. So, uh, okay. So, sorry about that. So, you missed this, but basically, three things: EIPs, protocol specs. Um, so, EIP one, uh, EIP fifteen fifty nine. There's the EL spec, CL spec, yellow paper, um, and then. Uh, once we actually have a spec for Ethereum, uh, the way that it gets actually used in practice is through these production client implementations. So um, these teams come to consensus on what the spec should be, but then there's you know about ten teams that actually write production software that uh, effectively is what we call an Ethereum node and that gets used um, to like run this protocol in practice. And so you can think of like, you know, the, the, the simplest kind of uh, mental model for like how Ethereum governance works or how Ethereum gets upgraded is there's a new EIP that comes in, it gets applied to the specs and then it gets implemented in clients and then it goes live. Um, in practice, it's like a bit more complicated than this. So this is like a diagram that I uh, had for like an internal doc uh, about uh, six, nine months ago trying to wrap my head around what the actual process is like more than, um, you know, like these, this just like specifications. So um, what I want to do now is just kind of run through like a case study with uh, going through this and seeing like how it actually happened in practice. Um, and this will give you like a better feel for like, how do you go from this clean model to like, how do you actually ship a hard fork and specifically like, um, what does it involve from like an engineering side and a core development side, um, which is, you know, what you'd end up working on if you joined a client team full time. 
And then one caveat I'll put on this is that um, I've tried to bias this talk in like a more technical perspective. So um, obviously like a lot of these changes can have both like technical complexity, but also like social or political complexity. So say we want to like change the issuance curve on Ethereum. Um, you know, it's a one line change in the spec. It's it's quite trivial to do, um, but obviously it has huge implications. And there's not really like a formal way in which like that whole uh, sort of more social or political uh, process is defined. So um, for this talk, I'm going to stick to like, you know, assume that there's like social consensus around the change and we're trying to actually just get it done from a technical perspective, what actually happens. Um, so one, um, yeah, so one case study I thought was good is EIP 4844, which was part of the Dan Kuhn fork. Uh, for those of you who, who are not aware, 4844 was like this pretty big change to Ethereum, which added blobs as an ephemeral storage type. And it's kind of the full, the, the first step towards uh, a fully sharded uh, data availability network on Ethereum. So um, yeah, so I'll, I'll start with like a timeline to give you a feel for like what happened, how long it took, and then I sort of go through it step by step. And so the first thing, uh, that came out is in December 2021, Denkrad had this doc called New Sharding, um, which effectively uh, built on a lot of the work that was previously done as part of like the E2, uh, E2.0 research. Um, and previously, the idea was that there'd be all these different shards and people would be assigned to just one shard. Um, and, you know, we'd like shuffle validator around on these shards. And then uh, Denkrad's idea, which is now called Denk sharding, is like instead instead of like having a bunch of shards, just imagine there's like this big amount of data, and we just get people a sample from like this big uh, this big blob of data. Um, so that was the first proposal uh, in December 2021, and then in February, oh, sorry, February 2022, um, Denkrad, uh, Proto, and and a couple others drafted the CIP, EIP4844, um, which we've called proto dank sharding because it was effectively the first step to get towards Denkrad's proposal. What it would do is kind of do all of the scaffolding work on Ethereum to enable these blobs to exist. Um, but instead of using data availability to like sample only a subset of the blobs, it would use a more naive approach, which is just like have smaller blobs and have everybody download all of them but still have them expire after some time. So the blobs are only ephemeral. Uh, we have all the architecture to like send them, gossip them, process them. But the one thing we don't have there is data availability sampling. Um, so this sort of served as the first step. Um, and so about a month after that, um, the EIP was proposed, was, pro was presented on Awkward Devs uh, by Proto again. Uh, by that point, they had a prototype uh, in both Geth and Prism. And they were hoping to get it included in the next hard fork. Um, and they were still looking you know, for some, some uh, technical feedback on a bunch of details. So in about like a three month period, sort of went from like Denkrad's proposal to like um, EIP4844 being sort of the first version that could be implemented um, to being prototyped uh, and, and then proposed on all core devs. And then, you know, uh, question is like, whether we just, you know, accepted it on all core devs and, and shipped it then. Um, and then the answer is no. Uh, so if you look back at this, <laughs> at this, at this chart that I have, um, if you go all the way to the, to the left, you know, like, these things tend to start with like more informal proposals, um, you know, whether they're like a hack MD or some ETH magicians post um, or whatnot. So like you can think of like Denkrad's post as being that. Um, and then, you know, once they had that, uh, the EIP 444 proposal was actually the, the, the thing that was formally proposed. So had to open a PR against both the EIP repo, the CL specs repo, get that merged um, and then come on all core devs to present it and then I think 4844 was actually kind of good in that by the time it got there, it already had uh, some prototype client implementations. Um, but you can see that, you know, they're about a third of the way through the process um, of this thing. So a lot of people tend to think like getting to the EIP fleshed out and prototyped is basically the last step of the process. Uh, but in practice, you're probably like, yeah, about a third of the way there. So um, what happened next? Um, First, so we had this, I think people thought it was an interesting idea. They wanted to work on it. Uh, scaling has been part of Ethereum's roadmap since the, the very start. So we started having these breakout rooms where we would just focus on prototyping 4844, you know, fixing implementation issues, getting more clients on board. Um, so 
you know, after the, the Alcor devs call in March where Proto presented, they took a couple months to refine their prototypes. And about uh, two, three months after that, they start having the first uh, first breakouts. Um, and then by through the process of like having these breakouts, having other teams starting to pay attention, by August of that year, we had like a first dev net that people could use. Um, Prism and Geth were, were sort of peered there and then other teams could try and uh, interact with it and, and um, effectively, you know, test their implementation that way. Um, and then in December of 2022, um, so basically, uh, if we go back to when Proto proposed it, which was uh, in March, so like nine months after I was first proposed on Alcor Devs, um, the client devs decided to include Fort 4.4, but not in the coming fork, realizing it would be like far too big of a change to include alongside the beacon chain withdrawals. We decided to include it in the fork after that. So we effectively like created the spec for the next fork uh, only to like include 4.8.4.4. Um, and again, this is about like a year after we had uh, the original proposal for uh, the new Dank sharding. So once we had that, so we'd made the decision to include it, um, you can think of it as being about like two thirds of the way through this chart where, um, you know, previously we were, you know, pretty much in the consensus building phase, figuring out like, okay, do we want to do this? When do we want to do this? We agreed to do it. So it's like, okay, now we know that this is included. We add it to all of the specs. We create a new hard fork for it. Um, but we're still kind of iterating on the specification for 4844. There's still some bugs that need to be fixed, some cross client issues. We spend a lot of our time at this point just working on different dev nets, uh, setting up different testing scenarios, fuzzing all of this. Um, so it sort of goes from this like speculative engineering effort to everybody's main focus and um, sort of refinement and, and, and getting things to production readiness. And so to get there, um, we had, you know, we kept having these breakout rooms every week, every two weeks, um, focused on improving, um, you know, improving the dev nets, improving the specs and whatnot. Uh, you can see here uh, on the left what I screenshot. So at some point in around uh, July of last year, um, these breakouts started going from just 4844 breakouts to Denkun breakouts as we started adding more EIPs in that hard fork alongside it. Um, and then, more and more dev nets. So by the time we got to the full Denkun uh, scope, we went to all the way up to 12 dev nets. So pretty much like once a month uh, for a year, just you know, um, having all the clients try to get the EIPs working, figuring out what's what's broken, fixing the specs, relaunching a new dev net with all of the clients again, and over and over doing this process. And then in December 2023. Um, basically two years after the initial the dank sharding hack md proposal we had like what i'll call like beta final specs where um we had the specs that we were going to use to go live on test nets um in in the months after that um but we still expected to have minor changes made to and then um Early 2024, we decided that we were finally ready to uh, fork the Gordy testnet. Um, one of the things that was interesting in this fork is uh, Gordy was going to be shut down after it. Um, so the stakes were a bit lower to forking Gordy, and we probably did it a bit earlier than we otherwise would have in the process because we, we sort of, um, yeah, we weren't afraid to break it, worst case. Um, but it actually went quite well. So uh, two weeks after that, we announced the forks for the two other test nets, Sepolia and Holsky. And then after seeing those test nets also fork successfully in late February of 2024, uh, we announced that we would fork on March 13th. So effectively two years after the EIP came out. Um, and so this sort of got us through the entire flow of, you know, from this original HackMD all the way to shipping the thing on mainnet. Um, and for something like 4844, this took about two years. Um, and I would say like relative to how complex of a change 4844 was, this was actually quite quick. Like there are many examples in Ethereum where um, we've had smaller changes take far longer than this to ship. Uh, EIP 1559, which I presented at the beginning, had a similar process, but played out over, I think, a bit more than two years. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, hopefully this is like a useful kind of walkthrough of, you know, if you are working on these large changes to Ethereum, like what should you expect? Um, where it's not just, you know, you write this EIP, you get in the specs and you ship it. Um, 
a lot of the process is actually quite iterative where, you know, once we've actually decided that something is important and we want to focus on it, then it's about getting all of these different uh, runs in where we test different clients together, we test different uh, different scenarios and style of tests and fuzzing, find everything that's broken, fix it, get another run again over and over and over until we're confident that this thing is actually safe. Um, and I think from the outside, this is something that's not quite well appreciated where most people focus on like, you know, the first half of this diagram where like, okay, what EIP is going to be in the next hard fork? Um, and then assume that when we say like, okay, this is in the next hard fork, it's almost like the work is done. Um, but from the perspective of someone working on a client team, you, you can almost think of it as the opposite where it's like, there's a, a sense in which it almost doesn't matter, you know, what the what the debate is. And then once we actually decide like, okay, we're going to do this in the fork, then the quote unquote real work begins of actually testing this and getting it to a spot where, um, you know, we're confident in deploying it on Ethereum. So yeah, hopefully this was useful. Happy again to take some questions about this um, after and, and go into more details uh, in any parts of that diagram. Um, but one thing I wanted to also cover is, you know, when we talk about this, we say like core devs are the people who work on this. And I think it's important to just kind of talk through like what core devs actually are, or at least how I perceive them, um, because it's, it is like a weird nebulous term. So, you know, it's like this mix of everyone working on the client teams, everyone who's like a researcher full time on Ethereum and a bunch of other people in the mix from testing teams and others. In practice, you know, we have over 10 client teams. They're spread out across a bunch of different orgs, um, spread out spread out across the world. In research folks span, you know, there's folks in academia, folks working for VC firms, anons, folks working at company, folks working at the EF. And then a lot of the people that, that end up contributing to Ethereum just sort of show up in the Discord and start contributing. Um, and EPF is effectively like, an effort by the EF to try and make that process a bit more standardized, where we saw that so many great contributors to Ethereum are just people who like randomly showed up one day and because they liked Ethereum and sort of got down the rabbit hole. Um, and while this is great, like we realized there's a lot of ways in which it's like a, a very limited funnel. So EPF is kind of our attempt to, um, to keep that sort of um, um, culture in a way where, you know, there isn't like a top down, it's not like a top down internship program where you're told like you have to work on X. Um, there's still like a lot of chaos and a lot of like self-determination. Um, but I think having the cohort and having like a couple of people uh, sort of mentor you and guide you through this can be like a helpful way to just, um, yeah, make that process a bit easier. But I, I do want to highlight this because like many of the most like talented contributors to Ethereum um, are people who just showed up this way. Um, and notably from this slide, so uh, the little pineapple avatar is Perlo Lambda. So he is the author of uh, EIP 4844. And he literally showed up one day to like solve a random problem that people were not uh, able to solve and uh, sort of got sucked the rat down the rabbit hole that way. Um, and, oh, why? Oh. Okay, yeah. And then, okay. So, and I think, yeah, like the way I, I sort of think about Cordes is like, there's a sense in which like people working in the core dev circles are focused on like Ethereum as a whole beyond a single EIP. So a lot of times like EIPs are driven, you know, by, we call them champions, but like someone comes in, they want to make like a specific single one-time change to Ethereum. Um, the way I think of core dev is like the set of people who will like review this and consider this in, you know, in the context of Ethereum as a whole, um, and will eventually, you know, take responsibility for like, is this protocol secure? Is this protocol sound? Um, and does this make sense? And those are kind of the people who like end up deciding like, which changes do we want to implement in these specs, in these client implementations, and then how do we want to propose them uh, for deployment? When do we think it's it's ready? And and this is kind of a weird definition, but there's a lot of value in keeping this like. Um, somewhat vague. Afri uh, has like the best uh, GitHub comment about this, where I think this was Filecoin who wanted, Filecoin wanted to like really formalize what a core dev was in their community and have like all of these criteria. Um, and Afri basically explains in this post that like, this is a bad idea for all of all of these reasons. Um, and, and I think, yeah, there is a lot of value in having this be a porous set where, um, 
you know, people can just show up and, and, and start contributing and sort of earn their place um, without it being, you know, you have to be at the EF or you have to be on a client team or you have to be, you know, have two years experience or anything like that. Um, and I think a couple of things that are important to, to, to balance this is like a lot of the, the calls and a lot of the work that happens on the core dev side is public. So for example, you know, we have this YouTube channel where we stream all of the breakout rooms, all of the core devs calls. Uh, we have Ethereum magicians and E3 search where all of the sort of uh, potential changes to protocols are discussed. And I think this is an extremely important part of the process where um, you want this to happen in the public, in the public because you want and you want to be able to come in and challenge it and improve on it. And I think this is one of the things that, that really gives Ethereum its strength as a community. Um, so hopefully it's like a helpful framing. Um, but again, I think if, if your takeaway is that like core dev is like this vague nebulous term, um, you should be okay with that because yeah, no one will give you like a very formal definition. And then last thing uh, I'll have before I wrap up is um, just talking a bit about like, what our team does at the EF to support all of this. So as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I work on a team called Protocol Support. And effectively, I see like the role of our team as supporting the ecosystem of Ethereum core contributors. Um, and you can think of it from like, you know, the, the most basic to like the most complex stuff. Um, so at the very least, you know, I run the core devs calls. Uh, I run some of the breakouts. So we just sort of show up and make sure that there's someone there to run the calls and facilitate these processes. Um, another huge thing we do is just EPF, like I talked about earlier, you know, we're trying to like create some sort of formalized version of this informal process of, of new contributors showing up. And then a bit beyond that, like some of the things we've, we've done uh, as well is one, just like these interop weeks. So when we are planning hard forks, um, we've tried in the past couple of years to get all the different client teams and contributors together for a week of like, working together on cross client testing for the upgrades. Um, so we just had our last one in May. And one thing that really surprised me is there were seven people there out of about 120 uh, who were from EPF. So they joined a client team and you know now we're like at, at Interop. Um, and then lastly, um, Protocol Guild, uh, some of you may be familiar with this, but um, this is something we helped, uh, we helped kick off a couple of years ago. But the idea is that um, a lot of core devs uh, would make more money going to work on, say, layer twos or applications or whatnot. Um, and this is bad because we want people to be there and like maintain Ethereum layer one. So we've started this community funded incentive program where all of, you know, major projects on Ethereum can donate to support core developers directly. And so um, effectively how it works is it's about, uh, it's like a list of all the different core devs um, that, that want to opt in that, have been maintaining and working on L1 for like over six months. Um, and then the funds get distributed to people based on how long they've worked on Ethereum. Um, they get distributed directly to the, the protocol contributors um, as is. So like uh, we recently had Tyco and Etherfi, for example, fund this and they effectively take their native token, put it in a vesting contract. And then over the next four years, it'll go to all of the, uh, all of the people that are part of Protocol Guild. Um, and I think in general, this is really important, just creating like, the both cultural and like financial incentives for people to come and stick around and maintain Ethereum. Um, because I guess as we've, we've sort of seen, um, it is a lot of work, it's complex work to do. It takes a long time to get this stuff done. Um, and there's a lot of value in having people stick around over longer periods of time to make sure that the, the protocol is well supported. Um, and with that right at half past, I will end here. Oh, sorry, one last thing yeah, before I wrap up. So there's three, I think if you want more of like the social or political side of governance, uh, there's three really good resources I'd recommend. One is uh, ethereum.org slash governance, and that also li links to other uh, resources as well. Two is Christine Kim recently put out a, a really good report uh, on Ethereum governance. Um, so I would, I would read that. And then I gave a talk uh, at ETC last year talking about governance. Uh, less from this technical and, and, and like development aspect, more from like the sort of social aspect and what the different stakeholders are. So if you're interested in that, uh, yeah, I'd suggest watching this. But yeah, hopefully this was helpful from more of like a uh, engineering and just uh, yeah development process perspective and happy to pause here and take uh, questions. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tim, for that uh, great presentation. Uh, <clears throat> people who have questions in the audience about 
uh, Ethereum governance or what it is to be a core dev, uh, please raise your hand and, and come vocalize it on the, um, cool. How about Dan? Let's start with you. Uh, you're muted, Dan. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Um, I read your um, Ethereum Magicians uh, post from, uh, I think, two weeks ago about the framework improvement. Uh, very interesting. It's something that uh, that is you were saying in the beginning that you are not expecting, you know, uh, support as is, but it's going to be discussed. Do you see the proposed for includence, uh, for inclusion, um, the, the three terms that you number there, like PFI, CFI, and, uh, and SFI, being something that would get, you know, to, to fruition and being uh, used? I hope so. Um, so we discussed that on last week's Awkward Devs, and I think people are like somewhat, uh, um, yeah, somewhat open to it. So my next step there is to make an actual like PR um, and 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 you know like make a, a formal proposal um, so that um, yeah so, so that um, yeah people can comment on that directly. Uh, can we have like a very short, uh, you know? pipeline thought experience uh, th uh, thought experiment of uh, if this gets you know into the the framework uh, would that improve the or shorten the lifetime of a EP, uh, AIP proposal for uh, would it shorten the life the the cycle of an EIP you know because if it's proposed for inclusion, then you present, I reckon, the idea yeah. to the teams or so you... yeah, yeah. So I don't think it would it would make things quicker. Like I, I think but the, the goal is that it makes things clearer. So right ah, now okay. the right now the problem is that it's not really clear which EIPs are proposed. I like maintain a list in a forum on these magicians, and then sometimes on the consensus area side they maintain a separate list on GitHub and it's just not clear. So having like a single place, um which would be like the 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 spec for the hard fork, which lists all the stuff that the community proposes feels better, and then being able to also just uh, kind of discriminate between like stuff that's being proposed, stuff that's being considered, and stuff that's included. Um, so I think having like one more level just helps us, um, yeah, better better like break down the different EIPs and 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 like explain to the community what's the status uh, of of each of them. Yep, clear. Thank you. Chris? Uh, next up, we have uh, Hoppenheimer. Yeah. Hi, Tim. Um, I mean, um, you do a great job of handling the all core devs meeting generally. I've, I've seen it, like, attended a few myself. So, um, great job on that. And, uh, like, uh, the question from my side would be uh, that you mentioned that all the all, all core devs come into consensus right like how do they come to consensus and uh like is it basically github reviewers being uh like verifying the uh, prs or how does that happen yeah great question um the way the way awkward devs comes to consensus is mirrored on how the ietf uh works which is like an internet standards organization and uh, the phrase we use is rough consensus and running code and the idea there is that we we do this on the calls where we have different teams kind of you know this debate and discuss like you know what they think we should do and at some point we don't necessarily we don't do like a formal vote but we try to gauge like what does the rough majority want um and are there any like strong objections and this is basically my job uh, to sort of like read the tea leaves and, and figure out like where, sh where we should land. Um, but it's, it's, it's kind of weird in a few ways. Like one, like it's not just like a naive majority. So if, you know, like everyone wants to do this, but somebody doesn't want to, and they have like a very strong or valid reason um, that we do try to hear that out and, you know, see like if it changes people's views. And there have been cases in the past where like, 
you know, we'd agreed to do something. And then right before we're about to ship it, someone found finds an issue with it that no one came up and they just like voiced it. And, you know, we've taken the thing out because uh, at the end of the day, we, we want to ship what's best and what's most secure for Ethereum. Um, but, you know, there's also cases where like some people disagree and then, but we don't, we also don't have a, we don't need like a full unanimous support. So, you know, even if like one team out of five disagrees and they don't think it's a good idea, we can still move ahead and ship something. And there's not like really a great process to like, you know, undo this. Like I think in general, people just like working together and understanding like there's a trade-off between arguing on something forever and then, you know, moving forward, even though you don't agree. Um, yeah, it, it usually sort of resolves itself, but um, there's not there's not like a great, uh, like um set of guidelines where it's like okay if we have like three votes from that team plus two votes from that team then it's good and otherwise it's not um and the last actually the last alcor devs uh the one from last week we ended up making a lot of these decisions about the next hard fork and some of them were kind of um contentious and not unanimous and i think just like listening to that call would give you an idea of what it looks like when um people don't necessarily agree 100 percent uh, but we still find a way to move forward Great, thanks for that, Tim. Um, Rory, you're up next. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, I had a question again about the the post that you did on the ETH magicians. So about your process improvements for ACD network upgrade and ETH magicians in general. Like, you know, it's received uh, several comments and views. But how do you ensure that your suggestions get fulfilled and actually happen? And will you, you know, test them out at first piecemeal to kind of see how that goes, or? I guess, how do you ultimately get as many eyes as possible uh, on these so that it has as much feedback as possible? So I guess, first of all, it's like, I can't assure that they happen, right? Like, I don't like choose, uh, you know, people have to like accept them. Um, I guess what I do to like maximize the likelihood that they do happen, um, one is keep like having the most minimal change with the highest impact, I think is quite good because again, like, if this was a company, you know, if you have a company, the CEO can just change their strategy and tell people, you know, we're working this way now. And, you know, if you don't like it, you're fired. We we don't have this on Ethereum, right? Like we, I don't get to say to people like, oh, you know, say that, like, I don't like that we have calls every two weeks. And I'm like, maybe we should have calls only like once a month. Someone can start a call on the week that I'm not doing the call and maybe their call is better than mine. And, you know, people will just like go there. So I think you you sort of have to like, accept where the process is propose changes that you know are are like with within like a, a reachable distance from the current process um and also just like i spend a ton of time talking with everyone who's part of this before i make this post right like i've probably spent the last six months talking with a bunch of different people and you know different contexts about like all the stuff i propose and then i'm like okay I think there's at least some people who think this is a good idea. Um, these things are, are relatively like easy to implement, um, you know, and so I think this is like the set that makes that makes sense. Um, but then, yeah, I think uh, uh, from the outside, like if I was looking at this with no context, I, I would say like, um, you know, it it's almost like a bit underwhelming because it's not like this huge like uh you know overhaul or like ethereum governance 2.0 um but i think these these like huge overhauls just like have no chance of actually working um so yeah small changes get a lot of feedback on them incrementally um and then yeah try to get adoption but again there's not like a, a, a specific number of people i have to convince or or like uh like a checklist um it, it's a bit more organic than that all right uh katya you're up next yeah hi team thank you for the program for you and yeah and uh, my question is about uh, resources um, if i want to contribute into eip uh, and i start from the main uh, page of eip and there is a link uh, to and there are a lot of links to ethereum magicians is research github so um what are all are all of them official or um you know, to, to get the information correct. Yeah. yeah. Short answer, I guess, to answer your last question, like, no, they're not official, but, you know, it's it's hard to, there's no, there's no, like, formal way. I think one thing I would recommend is 
if, if you're getting into the protocol, uh, like into protocol development, find like one subset of the protocol you're really interested in. Maybe it's like MEV, maybe it's like data availability, maybe it's like, you know, the EVM, like whatever it is, like, and then you basically have to like read everything on that and it's going to get you from like, you know, like official looking documents to like random hack MD posts by Denkrad from two years ago. Um, and I think like it's, it's much more efficient to try and find like a, a specific topic and then figure out everything you can read on it um, and, and just like consume all of this. Then trying to like understand the protocol generally and, and, and like go deeper and deeper across the entire protocol stack. Um, so I would just find like, yeah, the best resource you can about a specific topic and then effectively just like read all the links on that page and find which ones of those you found the best and then read all the links on that next page. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, there's no, there's no like great way to do this. I think EPF is kind of the best we have because you can like sanity check with other people. Like, you know, is this, is this specific link or is this specific thing like relevant? Um, but yeah, I think finding like the, the, the specific like niche that you're interested in and, and going super deep in that is, uh, like it is what will get you the best understanding over time of the protocol. Because say you study like, I don't know, data availability sampling, like at some point you're gonna need to figure out how it works with proof of stake. So you're gonna like learn a little bit about proof of stake as you're doing it, but it's easier to do that than to like learn how the entire proof of stake thing works and do data availability sampling and whatever else. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. There, unfortunately there's not like a single official resource for most of these things. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Tim. Um, I'm going to take a question from uh, our GitHub issue here. This one's from Chirag, and his question is, um, how do you overcome the challenge of working uh, with people working in different time zones? Yeah, uh, look, if you want to work on Ethereum, uh, most of the calls are at 14 UTC. Um, so like I schedule my vacations around Cordev's calls and like, I try to not have flights on Thursdays. Like it's, I, it's hard. There's no like silver bullet. Uh, Ethereum, the Ethereum community has found that 14 UTC is like the least worst time uh, for us. So like I would, um, and and some people like don't attend a lot of the calls and they're productive. But I'd say they're like the exception and not the norm. Um, they probably would have like succeeded in any environment. Like I think if you really want to get up to speed quickly, it's like it, being around you know, like 14 UTC plus or minus a couple hours um, means you're like online at the same time as people, you're able to join the calls, you're able to do that. Like that's uh, that's probably the best way. Otherwise, like, look, all this stuff is recorded and you can ask questions, you know, after the call and reach out to people. And like, I don't think it's, it's impossible, but it's just like more work. Um, but so, yeah, so from my perspective, it's just like, you know, I set my life around 14 UTC and like, uh, sort of adapted to that. Um, but I also have to run the call, which like most people don't like. So I think you can do, you can do it without showing up live on the calls if, if, if it's impossible. But if, if it is like, even if it's inconvenient, um, I think you do get a lot from, from it. Um, and maybe the one other thing that's like a bit similar is like, there are like ECC, DevCon, like the, the bigger Ethereum conferences are quite valuable. Like I'd say there's three, like the, the EF events like DevCon, DevConnect, ETC, and then the ETH Global hackathons, which the ETH Global events tend to be much more like geographically distributed. So maybe you can't go to DevCon, you can't go to ETC because it's like really far from where you live. But um, usually like within the span of one or two years, ETH Global will go like pretty much everywhere, like on every continent at least. Um, I think once you have like a bit of experience on Ethereum, like trying to attend some of these events, uh, many of which have like, uh, you know, financial aid if you if you if you can't cover the cost or stuff like that um there's there's like a lot of value there like i, I my first event was like ETH berlin in 2018 and it it's really like change it makes it go from like all these random little faces online to like this is actually real people in the real world doing stuff um so i would i would try really hard to get to like a, an ethereum conference i would avoid all the crypto conference like anything like these like token conferences or whatever, all of those are scams. You can just like avoid that. But like um, ETH Global, the EF events and ETCC, like if you can make it to like any of those, I would I would highly recommend it. Um, yeah. 
Great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, George, you're next. George Shaw. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, so some of our questions is already be uh, answered. I would like to ask more about uh, uh, how to socialize and uh, the idea uh, we are we're going to have, and also pro uh, because when I look at uh, uh, your presentation, that uh, thank take about three months to uh, firstly publish on the hack MD, and then uh, to uh, generate the first uh, um, you know EIP. It take a uh, it take a, a bit of while for him to socialize this idea and then to group uh, uh, you know attention and also um, yeah. people are interested in working together. Uh, I mean, um, there there are different ways. You're probably going to say yeah. there's no standard way, right? So no, no, but there's definitely better and worse ways. Um, I guess yeah. one thing I will say to start. So like you say, three months is a long a lot of time. I would say that was extremely quick. And like Prolo was like an ex Ethereum Foundation researcher, Denkrad is like one of the core researchers. And I think Vitalik is an author on the EIP as well. But I think like uh, in a way, like the socialization was like very easy for this one, just because uh, it was effectively like people who'd worked on this stuff for years that got together. And even that took like, yeah, three months to like get to a first proposal and then, you know, two years to ship. Um, so first, I guess my first bit of advice was like, if you want to do like an EIP and change Ethereum, you should expect that you're doing like a multi-year project, which will take a really long time. Um, and maybe you can like sort of lie to yourself a little bit and say that it'll be like a six months project, but then like you're going to just delay it for six months, four times, and it'll take you two years. Um, so like you should be, you should be fine with that. Um, I think what I, so first of all, like what I would do is see has anyone thought about the thing you want to propose before like there's a lot of eips and you know say you want to propose a new opcode or a new pre-compiled or whatever like looking through all the existing eips seeing like okay was there something like similar to this thing before and if so i think reaching out to the authors of those eips is probably a really good first step because they'll be able to tell you like why they designed the thing the way that they did and um you know like either you know they understood something you didn't or you understood something they didn't and then um like you'll, you'll probably get a lot of learning from that and most eip authors are like fairly easy to reach and mo most eips have like many authors so like if vitalik is an author on an eip you probably can't just like dmm your question but like usually you know say on 444 there's like five other people on that eip so like probably these other five people you can just like send a message to and like one of them will reply um so like first step is like, yeah, understanding the prior work, trying to reach out, get feedback there. I think assuming you have that, um, I would try to reach out to one of the client teams and see like, is someone actually interested on that? Um, and one way to do this is just by posting it on the agenda for all core devs uh, to look at. So say like, look, I have this, you know, new proposal and like I've you know, gotten feedback on it and then I'm looking for feedback from client teams and then you know, if if it's actually like something interesting and, and, and valuable, usually someone from a client team will like review it and give you feedback on it. And then I would just try to like work with them and, you know, figure out, OK, what would it take to get this implemented? What, what would it take to get this tested? Usually what they'll tell you, though, is more like this is everything that's wrong with it. Like this is how it could break. Um, and then, you know, it'll be on you to like go and fix that and find like a solution and potentially collaborating with them on it. Um, but I found like, yeah, starting from like, you look at the prior art, then you try to get someone from a client team to pay attention and to work with you. And then over time, you sort of grow the amount of people that are involved. So you go from like, okay, there's one client team is working on this. Now there's like two client team working on this and, and so on. And this is sort of how it becomes a two year effort rather than like a six month thing. Like it takes you six months to get to the EIP that you know, you're happy with, but then uh, it takes you another 18 months to get people on board and actually implementing it. Um, and in practice, it's like if you don't do that, because so many things compete for attention, um, unless this is like the most important thing on the roadmap, it's 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 likely that there'll just be something else that current teams are working on. Good, thank you. I, I guess, so yeah, and I'll, I'll ask one last thing there. So like, this assumes like it's kind of like a vanilla EIP, but like, I think some EIPs affect you know, like say account abstraction, uh, we talked a lot about that recently. Like um, 
in that case, like where there is like this huge other stakeholder group, like say wallets that are really affected by account abstraction, you'd want to reach out to them as well earlier in the process. Or say you did an EIP that changed, you know, staking or whatever. You want to get some feedback from like staking pools and staker and like economic like economists. So like I would yeah, I, I would also look at like are there other like big stakeholders that are affected by this and, and make sure that you get their feedback early on. Okay, but Tim, you think like, uh, uh, for example, research uh, forum uh, could be another place um, yes. will be better than the hack, uh, hack MD? Yeah, so and so what happens when you write an, EM, an EIP, it asks you for a forum link to discuss the EIP, which is Ethereum Magicians by default. So I think like, you know, a lot of the discussion will happen there. But oftentimes, if you have something that's like a pre EIP idea, then yeah, it can just be a forum post on ETH research or, or something and that's that's fine as well like um most of the you know many eip start out that's just like eth research forum posts so if you have something that's more of like a speculative idea than it is like a 40 form spec then I, yeah i'd start with like a forum post on eth research um okay yeah. great uh let's go with glory next hello Thank you very much, Tim, and the rest of the team for putting this up. So uh, my question, I think the um, majority of the questions have been answered already, but what I want to ask right now is how do we come up with uh, EIP in terms of the numbers, like let's say EIP 433 or 6900, how do we come up with those numbers? Is there like a standard or something to follow when There's a spreadsheet. The so when have... you... Okay. Yeah. yeah. When you put your new EIP, you don't put a number at the start, and then there's like a spreadsheet, and some guy will just tell you this is your number, and that's it. You can't choose it. Okay, okay, got it. Thank you. Of course, yeah. Um, next, we'll go with uh, Boma. Boma, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Hello, good afternoon. Okay, my question is on um, security and testing. I wanted to know if there is. Um, because I went through the articles and um, videos I saw on the wiki. The answer is that most of the security testing tools are like old. Are there people in place that are trying to come up with the new testing tools and all of that? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Mario Vega would be the number one person I would uh, push you to. So, um, so we, we, we had a lot of like, uh, testing changes on, uh, on especially on the execution layer. I'm trying to pull up the repo um, in the past like couple of years. So I would definitely reach out to um, the folks working on this. Um, Mario Vegas, Dan and Spencer are like the, probably the three uh, best people. Um, yeah, like, and, and so they basically rewritten the entire testing framework in Python, made it much better. Um, and they can definitely tell you like, what's missing and and what's uh what's kind of broken about it and i think they're um i think at this point yeah they even have like some tutorials for like how to write new tests and whatnot so i would um yeah i would go through like the execution spec test stock um use that as like a starting point reach out to mario or, or that team and they'll be able to tell you like everything that's missing but i think we are in a much better uh spot now where like we have actually a few people who are able to um to like uh, onboard others and and um, and uh, yeah, sort of give assistance. Awesome, thanks, Tim. Uh, we got a bunch more questions in the GitHub issue. Uh, I'm gonna invite uh, Risha to ask one of her questions uh, via voice here, if you want to do so, or other people that have questions in the GitHub, uh, would love to see your face and or interaction here uh yeah uh, so my question is like what are the current priorities of the ethereum's core development team or some of the changes that might be faced during the core development including like how the optimization security or uh, scalability are ensured together um so I guess on your first question, if you want to see like the priorities, I just posted in the chat what we're working on for the next hard fork. Um, that's probably the biggest priority. And then I'll post the set EIP as well. Um, that, uh, and actually, let me post the third one. I think those three are like uh, the biggest um, 
yeah, the biggest set of priorities um, and maybe Verkol as well. Um, so everything, everything I've just posted in the chat from like a technical perspective, I think is, is a priority. Um, I think with like your second question in terms of like how we, we approach um, like what we need and, and, and how we think about the broader roadmap, um, this is much less defined. And um, so I think if you are like, if you are just like getting into Ethereum, it's probably more valuable to think about like one of these things that I just posted and like go deep in it and try to understand how it fits in the whole picture rather than trying to like understand abstractly the like scaling roadmap. Um, and, and, and part of the reason for that is like you, a lot of the, when people write like these roadmap posts and I, I do a lot of those, you like remove a lot of the details, right? Because you're, you don't want to like get bogged into the like implementation details. But I think if you're actually working on the protocol, that stuff is like really important. That is a protocol. So I think it's like much more important if like say you look at the peer das or the Verkle EIP and you like actually understand how this things works, then like understanding the whole like stateless roadmap in the abstract because it'll take you like two minutes to understand the roadmap once you've understood the actual technical thing. Um, and 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 like trying trying to go from like the roadmap level thing down feels like it's just much harder. There's just so many ways in which you can just end up looking at the wrong thing or the like the the project that's just like slightly off from like what we're actually working on. Um, and I think this is like a, one of the big mistakes that like otherwise smart and talented people make when they want to contribute to Ethereum protocol development is like. They have a vision for where things should go that's like slightly detached from where things are actually going. And they're like stuck in their thing and they, they sort of don't see how the protocol actually evolves. Um, so yeah, I would I, I would really, really emphasize just like look at the stuff that people are actually working on now and try to understand it and like what's like special or unique about it. And and then like you'll you'll get a sense for the roadmap sort of uh, you know, on as a side effect and um, but at least you understand like the, the real thing. Great, thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so let's go ahead and go with Bastin. Uh, <clears throat> hey, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, I posted my questions in the uh, issue in the GitHub. Uh, it's a bit more technical. I didn't, uh, I don't know if it's uh, th that this is the right place for it or not, let me know. But uh, so my question is that uh, uh, I was wondering about working on uh, performance optimizations in the execution layer and specifically the uh, EVM. And then, uh, like, as I was thinking about this, uh, I thought that this might not really matter as much because uh, the, con the consensus protocol basically uh, keeps, like, one block per slot, per 12-second slot. So we cannot increase the like number of slots yes. or number of uh, blocks and uh, we cannot uh, increase the number of uh, transactions uh, per block because of the uh, gas limits and yes. so yeah so i was thinking that uh how the optimizations are still super important for like many reasons so like please keep looking into that a uh, couple of reasons why they're important the most obvious one is just l2s L2s that use EVM are not constrained by 12 seconds. So like there's a ton of, of um, there's a ton of like effort right now being put on like actually improving execution speed. Um, the REST team is spending a lot of time on that if, if you want to look into what they're doing. Uh, but even on L1, one thing is like um, if we have if we have like much, much better EVM execution, you can imagine things like with stateless, if we have stateless, then you can do parallel execution, for example, because you get the different witnesses for the state. Um, you can also, another way to think about it is like, if you have better execution, it means you can run nodes on lower end devices. So, you know, sure, we don't have like more transactions per block, but we have, you know, the same block on like a, a worse hardware and it's still running fine. So I think there's like, absolutely a ton of value from that. MEV is a whole other, you know, like can of worms there, but like um, it's it's cheap to verify a block, but building the optimal block is extremely expensive. So like any EVM optimizations you can do gets transferred into like better block building. Um, so I think like, yeah, there, there's like many, many different applications of this. And I think, um, yeah, it, it feels like something where we could have 
you know, 100 times more smart people thinking about it and uh, we still wouldn't have enough. So um, please don't be discouraged because we have a 12 second block time. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tim, for your time today. Um, I know that there are still some questions that didn't get answered. So for those of you that uh, would like to continue asking the questions, uh, I will create a thread in our Protocol Fellowship Discord uh, channel and um, we'll encourage Tim to maybe come answer a few more when he's got some time. He's often in that Discord server. So um, once again, thanks so much, Tim. Appreciate your time. I know you got to jump. So um, yeah, we'll see you all next week for uh, our first official stand up uh, where you'll talk about what you guys have been diving into over the past week. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, all. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tim. Yeah. And yes, yeah, see you on Monday, everyone. Um, and for the rest of the week,